Well, good morning. This is a very special occasion here this morning at South Lake Baptist Church, not only because we celebrate our veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces, but also we have a guest speaker with us this morning. He's actually a member of our church, and uh, Chaplain Rollison, John Rollison, and his family. They joined our church uh, just several weeks ago. Uh, they came in from uh, Texas, as there he was the uh, chaplain of the uh, Air Force Base uh, in, in Texas. He'll give you more details of that. He is now serves as the chief main chaplain here at Homestead uh, Air Reserve. He, he approached me uh, several weeks ago, several, several weeks ago, uh, about uh, serving as a youth pastor here at South Dade Baptist Church. It's not new to him, pastoring youth, nor is pastoral ministry. And so uh, we met together as deacons and we held a, a very uh, extensive meeting, shared his testimony and uh, brought, bringing forth to you the proposition of having uh, Chaplain John Rollison to serve as our youth uh, pastor for a Colonial Christian School, South Bay Baptist Church. And so with that, then I'm gonna ask uh, Brother John, if you're, you're already up there, if you'll come up here and uh, just to give you a bit of an uh, introduction. And then what I'll do is I'll ask Charlie to come in and read the main text that you're gonna be preaching on and turn the service over to you. Now, uh, also this evening, then we will have a question and answer time. This evening he will give his full-blown testimony of his uh, life experience in the military, serving the Lord and all the things that are important to us. And then uh, for all of you that are here today, uh, deeply appreciated and in the interest of the ministry of the church uh, be here this evening even though some of you as us as grandparents we may not have a vested uh, individual in a youth program but we are because we are a congregational rural church we do have a part in the selection of pastoral position at any level within the church. So uh, do not dismiss this, oh, this is just for kids only. This is a ministry, it is a ranking position, an office of the church when it comes to its leadership. So you wanna be here, field the questions, don't be afraid to ask, and, uh, and then we'll have uh, the, the vote. Uh, I think it's pushed out to two weeks later, mainly because of the dinner next week. So at this point in time, Brother John, if uh, I want to introduce you, thank you very much for being here with us this morning. And Charlie, if you'll come up now and read the, the text of scripture for us. Good morning again. Uh, we're now in Hebrews 11, 1 through 13 or 1 through 11? Uh, 1 through 6. 1 through 6. Okay, very good. I clarified that. Uh, Hebrews 11, 1 through 6. Hebrews 11, 1 through 6. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. It's certainly an honor to be able to speak this morning on this special service where we recognize uh, our veterans. As a child, my vet uh, heroes, my heroes were always people that had served in the military. Uh, and I remember very well, um, I, I used to look young. I don't know if I do anymore, but uh, so you might be surprised what I'm about to say. But I remember very well seeing pictures of the soldiers coming home from Vietnam. And, uh, and as a child, it seemed like, man, that, that they're wearing camouflage, they have rifles. They must have really had a good time over there, you know, not, not quite understanding what, uh, of course, was going on. And uh, my parents had the movie Sergeant York about Alvin York, who was the most decorated soldier in World War I. And as a child, I'd watch that movie over and over and over and just love the military, all things about the military. And so... It's exciting uh, to be able to be here on this Veterans Day. I enlisted when I was 19 uh, in December, and this coming December, next month on the 11th, I'll have been in the Air Force 24 years. 
And uh, it's been a blessing and uh, an honor to be able to serve, an honor to be here now. Homestead is my seventh assignment uh, in the Air Force, my fifth assignment as a chaplain, and seventh assignment uh, overall. And uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, I didn't realize I was going to come here and be an active duty chaplain. I thought we were going to transition back into the reserve uh, and, and do another ministry, but the Lord had other plans. Uh, but we're excited to be able to be here and the partnership that we've had. You know, South Dade Baptist Church has been such a blessing to us already. And, uh, and I'll talk more about that tonight, and I would encourage you to come back, and I would love to just get to know you a little bit better and for you to get to know uh, our family a little bit better as well. You know, people are designated as heroes sometimes during their lifetimes for achieving great things. But the people that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, famously known as the Faith Hall of Fame, they're remembered for their faith. They're heroes because of their faith. And, and what we're going to talk about this morning is what, what is faith? What is faith? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. You know, the most compelling thing, I believe, about the people listed in Hebrews 11 is that they were ordinary people, people like you, people like me, ordinary people. The only thing that they had going for them, the only thing that set them apart is the same thing that's available to us, and that is their faith. Now, we'll define faith this morning by looking at two kinds of faith, the faith that it takes to become a Christian and the faith that it takes to walk the Christian walk. So I would ask you to pray with me one more time this morning, and then we'll jump into the text and find out what God's Word teaches about faith. Our gracious Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to be here this morning. And I'm grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to proclaim your Word this, this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts and minds to receive this truth, that everything that is said and done here this morning, God, will be pleasing to you, because we realize, Almighty God, that we're all participants, and you're the audience. And you're watching each and every one of us to see how we respond to your word. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that you will be glorified above all things this morning. We ask this prayer, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Well, in verses 1 and 2, as Charlie's already read to us, we have a description of faith. And we read in uh, verse 1 there that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not th seen. And so you think about that. Faith is the, the act of holding on to something which has substance. It doesn't operate in the realm of theory, but in the realm of practice. The faith and its basis, which are the promise of God, have much substance in reality. Faith is reading the Word of God, believing it by taking it at face value, and then responding to it in obedience. And faith is based on what God's Word teaches, not on what our senses discern. So as we study God's Word, and, and, and we read God's Word, and we take God's truth into us, and the Holy Spirit quickens us, enlightens us, enables us to understand these truths, and we, we grow stronger in our faith, and we grow closer to God. See, as comfortable as many Christians may be with this concept, the concept of faith, many times it's a difficult one to communicate. To become a Christian, we must redirect our faith from ourselves to God. We're not focused on ourselves anymore. We're, we're focused on God and on Jesus. We must stop trusting in ourselves and our parents and our heritage and our morality and begin trusting in Christ. We must base our eternal life on Christ alone. We must take him at his word that he alone is able to save us. I have a very clear memory about, my goodness, 12, 13 years ago, our oldest son, John, he was just a, just a little boy younger than our youngest son, James, is now. Perhaps two, perhaps three. And I remember we were sitting on the couch together. And I was reading and he was watching cartoons on tele... Okay, we were both watching cartoons, probably. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. Just out of the blue, he jumped up on the couch, and he grabbed my face in both of his hands, and he said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. <laughs> and I was so surprised. And he said... And then he sat back down, just very calm, and he said, I believe Jesus, Dad. Do you believe Jesus? And I said, Yes, I do believe Jesus. He didn't say believe in Jesus. He said, Believe Jesus. I'll never forget that. And I said, yes, John, I believe Jesus. And he said, well, that's good because you're the preacher. <laughs> and so very intelligent, even at that young age. But you see, it's, it's something that's so simple, even a child can understand. But sometimes describing it can be very complex, very, very hard to do. We realize, of course, saving faith. Saving faith, what does that mean? Well, first of all, we have to realize that we're separated from God by our sin. 
We read Romans chapter 3, verse 10. It says, no one seeks after righteousness. No, not one. We read Romans 3, 23. We read that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When I was 16 years old, I heard a pastor explain this truth. And I realized for the first time what I needed to do to put my faith in Christ. That's why youth ministry, one of the reasons it's so important to me. You know, he didn't have to buy me pizza. He didn't have to act like some cool guy. He just told the truth. And that's what we have to do. We were, and you'll learn a lot more about that tonight. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Tonight you can hear, as I say, the whole boring story. But we realize that our sin separates us from God, and the only way we can be reconnected to God is through faith in Jesus, because if we go to Romans chapter 5 and read verse 8, we read that God demonstrated his love towards us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that means that even though we don't deserve it, we put our faith in Jesus, we can be saved from our sins, we can be forgiven, and we can be connected to a holy God and be with him for all of eternity. We don't deserve it. That's what grace is. It means you're getting something that you don't deserve. I, and, and I think it comes from my family. We all have this problem that we like really fast cars. And I drove Mustangs for years. My dad's a big Ford guy. Uh, when I bought a Dodge, I had to break it to him like this. I told him I bought a Toyota first. And then I said, I'm just kidding, I bought a Dodge. And that kind of lessened the blow. But when I was younger, and I'm not joking, I, I don't drive fast now. It's kind of funny. I have a fast car, I have a charger, but I drive slow. But when I was younger and more irresponsible, sometimes I would drive a little bit too fast. And many times I'd be driving home from work and I would get pulled over and the police officer, seeing that I was in the military, would let me go. That's grace. I deserved a ticket, but they didn't give me one. That's grace. Now, one time, a highway patrol officer pulled me over, and I got justice. They gave me a ticket. I got what I deserved. When we put our faith in Jesus, we, we don't get what we deserve. We deserve to be separated from God forever because of our sin, but because of our faith in Jesus, we can be with him for all of eternity. We get what we don't deserve. And that's what we hold on to. That's what we put our faith in. We can't see Jesus. Look at verse 1. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We can't see him, but we can read about him. The Holy Spirit can convict us of him, but we can't see him. We have faith in something that has substance, even though we can't see it. See, this is what Hebrews 11 is all about. When God spoke, the men and the women recorded in this chapter believed what he said, and in spite of incredible odds, they would step out on his promises and do what God said in spite of all the evidence to the contrary that might be staring them in the face. One of my favorite examples throughout all of Scripture about faith can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Don't worry about turning there. I'm just going to share with you what happened. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, King David became king of all of Israel. Israel became united. He had been for a few years before that king of Judah, which was the largest tribe. But we read in 2 Samuel chapter 5, he became king of all of Israel, all 12 tribes together, unified once again. And before David became king, he was a soldier, and David had a perfect record. You know, I don't know what the popular football team around is around here, if it's University of Miami, Florida International University, University of Florida, I'm not sure. But we know when we watch football, I know volleyball is popular around here, whatever sport it is, we look at their record, right? 15 and 0. If it's baseball, it's like 150 and whatever. They play so many games. But we look at their record. David's record as a soldier in fighting the enemy was perfect. Every time he went up against the Philistines, they were the bad guys. Philistines, they didn't even work. They lived along the shore. And they would go in and steal from people. They would make raids. That's how they made their living. They were evil. And whenever David and his soldiers went up against the Philistines, they beat them every single time. And if we go to 2 Samuel chapter 5, and I'm going to read this to you very quickly so I don't mess it up. It's in verse 17. It says, When the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over all Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. Every single Philistine soldier came after him. And like I told you, David was a successful soldier. He knew what to do. Every time he went to battle against the Philistines, he won. He had a perfect record. God was with him. It would have been even easy for David to say, I know what to do. Send in the Air Force, right? Unfortunately, he didn't have one. He could have been even more successful. But you work with what you have. He knew what to do. He prayed. He prayed. He went to God. He prayed. He said, God, should I go out against them? And God said, go. 
And he went, and they had a major battle, and the Israelites easily defeated the Philistines, and the Philistines went back, and they regrouped, and they came at him again because they realized this guy was a general. He beat us every time. Now that he's the king, we're in big trouble. we got to take him out. And so they went out a second time. And David again went and prayed, and not only did God tell him to go out and fight him, he gave him the battle plan. He said, here's what you do. You go hide over here, and when you hear him march, and you come and attack him, and you read this in the Bible, and you think God told him how to fight? David had great faith, and he spoke to God. He prayed, and God answered his prayer, and he told him clearly what he needed to do. He didn't have faith in himself. He had faith in God. And up to that point in his life, when he first became king, he always followed, and he always at that time was obedient to God, a great example from Scripture about somebody who had great faith and who lived his faith in something that he couldn't see, that we can't see. Let's look at the second statement in verse 1. The second statement in verse 1 is the evidence of things not seen. You see, we live most of our Christian lives on the basis of things that we've never encountered with our senses. We haven't touched the Lord Jesus. We haven't spoken to the prophets. And yet this should not be a detriment to our faith. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, it refers to Christ as a person whom having not seen, you love. And though now you do not see him, you believe, you rejoice with inexpressible and full glory. In the end, in the end of the faith, which we place in the one whom we've seen is the salvation of our souls, according to 1 Peter 1, 9. You see, faith sees what the physical eye cannot see. The Southern Baptist evangelist Vance Havner, he said that when faith is a reality, people see the invisible, choose the imperishable, and they do the impossible. We set big goals because we have faith. We know that we can achieve great things for God and for his glory because we have faith, not on our own merit, but because of our faith in God. That's how we're able to do these things. This is what drives us, and people of faith are ready to act and live on the basis of their convictions, on the basis of the revelation of God through his word. And they're sure of the promises and just as sure as the blessings that are to come. We have to have faith. One of my favorite ministers is a man named Erwin Lutzer. He's retired now, but for many years he pastored Moody Church in Chicago. And Erwin Lutzer told this wonderful story one time about a man that was traveling through the desert, stranded, and he was dying of thirst. And up ahead of him, he saw something that looked like a small building, and he wasn't sure if it was a mirage or if it was real. And the man stumbled into this building, and when he got in there, he found a well and a bucket of water. And taped to the well was a sign, and the sign said, in this bucket is exactly enough water to prime this pump. And so he had a choice. He could drink that water, and then it would be done. That would be it. Or he could take that bucket and he could use it to prime the pump to the well and then he would have enough water to last him as long as he wanted for the rest of his life. And we understand, of course, that that's a metaphor for this life. We can believe that this life is it, the bucket. One day it'll be over. Or we can believe that there's something more. We can have faith in the God of the Bible. And we follow his principles be obedient to his word and have faith and trust in him. And everything that we do, we do it for him and never for ourselves. When we put our trust in him, we know that we can have this, this eternal life. So I would challenge you, think about the eternal, not the temporary. The God that we believe in can give us eternal life if we simply trust in him. Now we're going to jump down to, to verse 6. And we read that without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So we understand from this verse that faith is pleasing to God. If we attempt to do anything for God in our own strength, we do not meet the demands of faith. We can't do it on our own. We have to do it for him and through him. We're saved not by our works, but through our faith. Ephesians 2.8 teaches us that very clearly, 2.8 and 9. Many people believe in the concept of a God, but when pressed, have a hard time defining who he is. And that's not the same faith as the God who, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, in these last days, in these last days, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. 
this is the God that we believe in. This is the God that we hold on to. You see, there's a respectable intellectual content to our faith. Biblical belief is not some mindless leap in the dark. The faith we exercise in the Jesus of the Bible is the exact same faith exercised by those who lived in his presence over 2,000 years ago. The only thing that separates us is time. The content of our faith is rooted in historical realities. If they did not exist, which completely negate our faith, but we understand these things are true. These truths are evident to us. Also, faith demands that we seek after God. Look at verse 6. We read there that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. You know, nowhere in the Bible will you read that you can do whatever you want and live however you want, and God will bless you anyway. That's not true, and, and it's not scriptural. We see in verse 6 that he rewards those who do nothing. No, those who seek him. And in the Bible, the concept of seeking God is almost a synonym for faith and the terms being used interchangeably. Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Jeremiah 29, 13, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Amos chapter 5, verse 4, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Matthew 6, 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek the Lord and faith in the Lord are the same thing. Now, I need to answer something for you. Because I have, I have no doubt in my mind that everybody in here is hanging on every word I'm saying. And I, why, why do people laugh when I say that? I'm just joking. I understand. We have short attention spans now because we, we click our phone, right? And then it's gone. And... But I said something earlier. I actually quoted another verse, and that was Romans 3.10. It said, no one seeks after righteousness, no, not one. So how can it be that no one seeks after righteousness, but then some seek the Lord? You know, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. How do we, how do we wreck that? How, how, you know, what, what are we talking about here? And what they're talking about here is that on our own, without the Holy Spirit yielding us, we, we will not look for him. If we were to read Romans, uh, or excuse me, well, Romans 3.10, which I already shared. No one seeks after righteousness, no, not one. But then we read John 6.33. In John 6, Jesus said, No one comes after me, but the one who sent me draws him. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to make us do anything, but God draws us. How does he draw us? Well, Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, before we put our faith in Christ, we were lost. When we put our faith in Christ, we became found in Jesus. We have our identity now in Jesus, not in anything else. In Jesus. So Jesus seeks us now with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit turns, we read in Jeremiah, the heart of stone into a heart of flesh, and we can make that decision. We can make that choice to put our faith in Christ or choose not to. He's not going to make us do it, but he gives us that opportunity. We know that anyone who seeks after him, it's not because of our own merits, but because the Spirit draws us. This is what we clearly read in Scripture. And we also understand that faith is at the center of our entrance into salvation, but if we leave it there, and if we do not continue to exercise faith daily, we will fail daily to live an obedient spiritual life. It takes a great deal of faith to live in opposition to a world that puts pressure on us from every direction. Going to church, reading the Bible, praying, giving of our resources, these are all acts of faith done in obedience to God's Word. It takes faith to do them because they're not our natural tendency. We must walk by faith as believers or we will not walk at all. You know, one thing that I used to say a lot when I served as a youth pastor previously, I also said it a lot when I was a, a senior pastor. And the simple truth is this, if we don't read the Bible, we won't act like a Christian because we won't know how. We have to stay in the Word. It would be nice if we were just walking down the street one day and God would zap us with Holy Spirit knowledge. Bam! Wow, I know everything. It doesn't work that way. But if we stay in the Bible, if we stay in the Word, if we pray, we can learn things. Think about this. If you read the Bible for 30 minutes every day, that would give us 23 hours and 30 minutes to do whatever else we wanted to. It's a pretty good payoff, isn't it? We need to stay in the Word, and we need to know the Word, and this is how our faith grows. This is how our knowledge of God grows. And then the Holy Spirit, when we need it, the Scripture that we read, He'll bring it to our mind when that temptation comes, when that struggle comes, because we know the Word. You see, a look at the faith exercised by the individuals in Hebrews 11 illustrates how important it is not to believe only initially by faith, but to walk in faith as well. 
In verse 4, we read that Abel made a presentation to God by faith. He learned what kind of offering would please God, and he presented that offering by faith. In verse 5, we read about Enoch. He revealed the possibility of faith. He never died, but was taken to heaven by God by faith. In verse 7, Noah revealed the performance of faith. He preached for 120 years before the blood came, but apparently won nobody to faith except his wife, his sons, and his daughter-in-laws, yet he didn't stop doing what God had commanded him to do. How about Abraham? We can read about him in verses 8 through 12. He showed the progress of faith. He had a tent and an altar showing that he was a pilgrim and a worshiper. And Abraham showed the continuing progress of faith in God. And then Sarah in verse 11, she showed the patience of faith well past the age of childbearing. She believed God's promise that she would become the mother of a great nation. And then we can read about, in verses 20 through 22, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, they demonstrated the promise of faith. They carried forth the promise that God made concerning the future of Abraham's descendants. And then we think about Moses. He showed the persuasion of faith. Joshua and Rahab, the peril of faith, and the list goes on and on and on. We read about these people in Hebrews 11. And then we can go back to the Old Testament and read about their lives. Read about what they did. Learn from them because that will help us remember November 11th in the United States of America is the day that we have set aside to remember veterans. And I hope all of us have things that help us remember our spiritual practices, our spiritual disciplines, because we'll forget. We'll forget. I'm only 43. Some of y'all think, man, that's really old. Some of y'all think, well, he's still pretty young. My kids think I'm old. That's okay. But I don't remember things nearly as well as I used to. I have to write things down or put it in my phone or do something to help me remember. We need to do things to help us remember because it's important. All throughout Scripture, we'll read about people doing things to help them remember, building monuments, setting up memorials to help them remember. We read about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus on Luke 22. Jesus was walking with them. They forgot everything that he had taught them. And then when he disappeared from their sight, this passage reads, then they remembered his words words. What do we need to do to help ourselves remember? Seven or eight years ago, my father, who was a mechanic by trade, uh, well, he was a welder, but he loves working on cars. He just never wanted to work on anybody else's cars. He liked to restore classic cars, and uh, most of them, like I mentioned to you before, he's a big Ford guy. By the way, I say that, Pastor, realizing that I lost half of you. (laughs) You know, like all the Chevrolet people are like, hmm, Uh, But anyway, I just, you know, God loves us all, right? The answer is yes. But my dad, being a mechanic, he never wore any type of jewelry or anything uh, because he could get caught in something and you could lose a finger uh, or or, or worse. So a few years ago, he he gave me this ring. I'd never seen it before because he never wore it. It sat in a box for however many years. And he said, this is your great-grandfather's ring. His name was John Rollison also. We're not original in our family. We just name everybody John. Uh, I would have named Caroline and James John as well, but Rachel didn't want to. My great-grandfather, he was in the United States Army, and he served in the Philippines right after the Spanish-American War at the turn of the 20th century. He bought this ring at some time, and then he gave it to his son. Guess what? His name was John as well. He served in the Third Army under General Patton in World War II. And then he gave this ring to my father, and my father served in the United States Navy during the Vietnam War. He wasn't in Vietnam, but he was in during the Vietnam War. And then he gave it to me. And one day I'll give it to my oldest son. And I only wear this ring because I'm not much of a jewelry person either if I wear this uniform, if I wear a suit, like on Sunday mornings to preach. But whenever I take this ring out of the the box uh, where my tie clip is, I think about my great-grandfather, whom I've never met, He died three years before I was born. I think about my grandfather. I think about my father. And I think about my son. And and even in my mind, we can think about so many things because the way God made us in just half a second, I, I have that memory of them, of our family. And it's infinitely more important that we have something, that we have something that helps us remember what, what Christ did for us. That we remember to he gave his life for us, and he asked us to live for him. That's what our heart's desire should be, to live for him in faith. We do these things for him, never for ourselves, but for 
God, what helps us remember? The Holy Spirit helps us remember. God helps us remember. So I would challenge you this morning, and, and think about this. Maybe it's not important to you because you, you don't know him. You don't know, maybe you don't know him. You know, maybe you're sitting there thinking, you know, I, don't, I never read the Bible, and I never pray, and I don't think that's a problem. Brothers and sisters, and I'm telling you this because I love you. Uh, I, I didn't come, come up here my first day to alienate everybody, right? Uh, but I do remember a professor in seminary. He said, do you want to keep people happy while they're going to hell, or do you want to upset them and tell them the truth? So here's the truth. We need Jesus because we can't do it on our own. And we have to realize, we have to realize that he loves us. And he loves us so much that he made a way for us to be with him for all of eternity. If we put our trust in him, if we put our hope in him, we can be with him forever. So I would challenge you this morning, and, it, and it's okay, it's okay. Uh, I'm used to people looking at me funny when I tell them that they deserve to go to hell, but I do too. But I would ask you this, if you've never made that decision, if you can't think of a time, if you've never, you know, because if, if it happened, you'll remember that you put your faith in Jesus Christ. For me, it was April 1993. I heard it. All have sinned. I remember thinking, man, that's me. I'm in that group. All means everybody. Not that there was any doubt in my mind anyway. Now, I grew up completely unchurched. That was one of the very first times I'd ever been in church when I heard that. But we know it to be true. All have sinned. The penalty for sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And if we profess our faith in him with our mouths, so we profess our faith in him, ask him to forgive us of our sins, we can be saved, and we can be with him for all of eternity. So I would ask you now, in the seriousness of this moment, to think about that. And if you can't think of a time that you made that decision to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to become a Christian, to become part of the family of God, that you would do that now. We're reading scripture that today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. I would encourage you to make that decision now. Do not delay. Why? Because God doesn't promise any of us a second chance. We read in scripture that God is no respecter of persons, and that means he doesn't make agreements with us. He doesn't make deals with us. We do things his way all the time. And so I would challenge you, if you it could, because eternity is at stake. The soul is eternal. Nobody is ever going to cease to exist. And everyone's soul will be alive forever in a conscious state, either in hell, separated from God, or with Jesus. And I pray that today you know where you'll be. So again, I would encourage you, think about that and think about what it means to be a Christian. And if you know that you're a Christian, I pray that you're in the Word daily. I can't think of anything more important we can do with our time than to be in the Word of God. So I would challenge you with those things this morning. I'm going to close this sermon with a word of prayer. Uh, I know pastor will come forward. We'll have the time of invitation. And if you have a decision that you need to make, I would challenge you to make it today while there's still time. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're grateful, Lord, for the opportunity we had to be here, uh, to, to learn from you, to hear your word, to fellowship with each other. And God, right now, I pray for each and every person within the sound of my voice. God, I, I pray for those that might be watching this on, on video months from now, weeks from now. And Heavenly Father, if there's a decision that needs to be made, I pray that it would be made now. The Heavenly Father, to put their trust in you. Heavenly Father, to seek that forgiveness, to become part of the family of God. Or Heavenly Father, maybe we know, as the old hymn says, maybe we know that we know that we know. We know that we're a Christian, but Heavenly Father, we've allowed something to become more important to us than you. And I pray, God, that you would forgive us for that as well that we could make that change, that we could turn things around, that we could be back in the right place where we need to be with you. God, whatever decision needs to be made today, I pray it would be made this morning before we leave this place for no other reason, God, than you would be glorified as a result of what happens here this morning. We ask this prayer, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen.